Well, good evening, and welcome to the How You Diet presentation on eye health. I'm Paul Malkus, President and CEO of How You Diet, and it's a real privilege to have you with us this evening. It's uh, just the beginning of the year. Happy New Year's to you, and I trust that everybody had a good and, and healthy holiday season. And as we look forward to 2016 and all the great things that it has in store for us, we're sure thankful that, that you're joining us this evening. We're real blessed this evening to have Dr. Siobhan Jackson Michelle with us. And, uh, we'll explain a little bit more about her and introduce her in just a moment and with this important topic of eye health. Before we get started, though, let's um, just go ahead and have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless our time. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this evening and thank you for the opportunity to, to share this information with people. We pray that she'll be with Dr. Siobhan as she shares this morning, or this evening rather, and pray that she'll uh, um, pray away all of the technical issues that may come up and that everything will come through clear. We give you honor and, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's been several years now that, that uh, Hallie Diet has actually been working on an eye health product. And um, as some of you may know, um, Reverend Malchus, when he first had um, cancer, or even before he had cancer, he actually was required to wear night vision glasses. And through diet and nutrition, um, he was actually able to um, have a clear vision test on his last um, driver's license test. He's now 82 years old, and he's no longer required to wear glasses. And so we know that firsthand that um, through diet and, and lifestyle change and through nutrition that we can not only uh, protect the eyes, but we can actually improve our vision and, and improve the health of the eyes. So it's real exciting as we share the information that we've learned and, and put together tonight. And uh, we're real privileged to have Dr. Siobhan Jackson Michelle with us. And, and she's a, a naturopathic, naturopathic doctor, but she's also... Um, has a degree in biomedical engineering. She's been in practice, um, private practice. She's also been in, in teaching as well as in product formulation. So she really has a broad um, broad experience in this whole world of, of health and nutrition and taking care of people. So Dr. Siobhan, we really appreciate you joining us tonight, and we know that you have some great information. And with that, we'll just go ahead and turn it over to you and um, um, share with us what you have. Very good. Good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to be uh, among you tonight, and I just um, am excited to share about eye health. So as you can see from the title of this presentation, I have kind of played on Shakespeare's probably one of his most famous uh, quotes, to be or not to be, but here we're going to apply it to vision. So to see or not to see, uh, we ask our supplements the answer. Okay, so if you guys would just continue with me. I have kind of presented uh, a number of quotes that reference the eye. Uh, and it's very interesting when you look at some of these quotes, you'll see that the eye is, is spoken about in a very holistic uh, view. Uh, oftentimes the eye is spoken about uh, when it comes to vision or when it comes to uh, perception or when it comes to... Um, creativity. So in the, in the um, top right corner here, top left corner, you see that originality is a simple pair of fresh eyes. And this is uh, a quote from Thomas Higginson. Uh, even from the Bible, it says that the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. Uh, even a funny one by Jim Carrey, behind every great woman, every great man is a woman rolling her eyes. So the eyes are spoken about um, in a variety of different ways. Uh, Dr. Seuss, uh, the character from many children's books, uh, he says one of his quotes, you will miss the best things if you keep your eyes shut. So all of these different quotes are in some way, uh, shape, or form referencing the eye, but referencing the eye from a, a, a variety of different perspectives. So the eyes themselves uh, are inherently holistic. As I mentioned, philosophy, psychology, religion, they link them to different things. They link them to the spirit. Uh, in the sense of the spirit, you're talking about the idea of creativity sometimes. You're seeing a place of joy or peace. Um, the soul, they related to the seat of emotion, 
drive, motivation, and even the mind. It goes back to uh, perception or the way one looks at the world, their outlook or sensitivities to things in the world. So the eyes, the way they're spoken about, the way they're referenced are from this holistic perspective. Um, in terms of physiology, in terms of anatomy, the eyes are also holistic in terms of informing us about the status of organs uh, of the body, organs that are not, say, part of the eyes or the face itself. Uh, the eyes give us information about our vascular health. So when the eye doctor kind of uses that ophthalmoscope and, and comes very close to your eye with this instrument, they're actually looking to the back of your eye and they're able to see blood vessels. And sometimes they're able to diagnose even the earliest uh, stages of high blood pressure or uh, diabetes because of the ways that the uh, blood vessels are being impacted. The eyes also give us information about stress reactions. Um, sometimes on a physical exam, a doctor will have a patient lay down and then sit up very quickly and take blood pressure uh, measurements at both positions, and they're able to see how the body responds to a stressor, like standing up or sitting up very rapidly. Um, how the pupils constrict will give information regarding that. The eyes also tell about thyroid health. So just looking at someone's eyebrows, a uh, doctor can kind of uh, do some diagnosis there as the eyebrows start to thin on the outer edges that tells about hypothyroidism. Even as the eyes uh, bulge out, if you've ever seen that, and different uh, actresses and actors, a uh, couple famous people have uh, this condition of hyperthyroidism. So again, relating back just to the eyes. Uh, most people are aware that the eyes, if you kind of pull down on uh, the lower eyelid, you can kind of look underneath there and see blood vessels or lack thereof, and sometimes that's a way of diagnosing anemia. And if the eyes turn more of a yellowish color, um, about liver health. So the eye as an organ is very informative. Uh, what most, most people don't even realize is actually that the eye is uh, a very unique um, uh, identifier, meaning that we consider, our, uh, we consider our fingerprints a way of identifying us. But the iris is now being used uh, by many different um, uh, agencies to uniquely identify each and every person where the fingerprint might have 20 identifiers. The iris is now known to have 247 identifiers. So it's a, an optimal um, organ for identification. As such, all of these things are just pretty much linking back to the fact that eye health should also be holistic, okay? So vision is the most feared sense to lose, okay? Of the five senses, most people are afraid of losing their vision. There's an interesting quote um, by an unknown author that says, among the blind, the squinters rule. And some people, as they age, they are just resigned to the fact that, okay, well, I'm going to lose my vision. My vision is going to, you know, be on the decline. Um, and that's just expected. So they're, they're ready to take that secondary role of, of just losing some of their vision as opposed to going completely blind. But what we're discussing today is the fact that you don't have to resign to this idea of just you know, losing vision altogether or even just uh, becoming a squinter or wearing glasses, that there's some proactive approach that can be taken. The aging population is the most high risk when it comes to uh, vision loss. Actually, baby boomers, which is the most rapid growing of all of the populations, this is ages 45 to 65, um, are the ones that are being the most impacted by uh, vision-related diseases. So there are four age-related eye diseases, which we'll talk about, um, and they're roughly impacting about 30 to 35 million Americans older than 45 years old. As I mentioned, baby boomers, this 45 to 64-year-old uh, level, are suffering vision loss almost equal to seniors. And seniors are roughly above that at uh, greater than 70, uh, 64 to 75 years old. So baby boomers in this younger uh, sphere are losing their vision or suffering some level of vision loss equal to people 20 years their senior. This is expected to double over the next 30 years. There's a couple reasons why. Um, slackness and screening, which means people just are not uh, following up. They're not uh, going according to screening uh, suggestions, which is seeing an eye doctor once a year at minimum. 
uh, there's a low priority for protection. What this means is that only 20% of seniors are actually uh, supplementing to protect their eyes or doing anything, whether it's diet related or whether it is using supplementation or um, some type of lifestyle uh, management to affect their eye health. Whereas a larger population, maybe 50%, are doing things to protect their bones and to protect their joints and to protect their heart, but not so much their eyes. Preservation is possible. This is another aspect. Many people, are, again, are resigned to the fact that as they age, their vision will decline. But people don't realize that you can preserve for a very long time, and there's even, as, uh, as Paul mentioned, a capacity to reverse in some cases. Vision loss in this aging population is associated with the four Ds. This is disability, depression, disease, and death. There's an increased risk uh, for those four Ds as a person loses their vision. There was a study done called the Lewin study, and they estimated that using a particular nutrient that we'll talk about later called lutein and zeaxanthin could actually save Medicare roughly $3.6 billion over five years by helping people with one of these age-related diseases called uh, macular de degeneration avoid dependence, okay, uh, transitioning into this idea of depending on other people. What I like to say today is that there's hope. Uh, more than 50% of vision loss is preventable, and supplements are associated with a significant risk reduction. Uh, when they compared supplements for bone health, for cardiovascular health, and for vision health, they actually found that though people spend more money, spend more effort, are more interested in protecting those other uh, age-related diseases, the impact of supplementation is much greater for eye health, 15 to 23% decline and things like age-related macular degeneration and cataract development when supplements are taken. So again, you have to understand that hope is possible. All right. Um, I have a question for you guys. Um, I or someone in my family suffers from age-related vision loss. So I'd like for you to just answer uh, this question with a yes or no. This question is actually pretty significant because uh, many of the age-related uh, vision loss diseases are associated with uh, heredity, meaning things like glaucoma. Glaucoma is very matched to uh, having glaucoma in your family history. Also things like macular degeneration and cataracts not so much related by genetics, but more so by just a lack of, uh, like I said, the slackness and getting preventive care and just an overall opinion uh, regarding eye health. So having uh, an, a history, knowing what your history is regarding your eye health is really, really, really important. So, so far, we have almost a majority of uh, people noting that someone in their family suffers from some related age-related vision loss, uh, more than three times the amount of people uh, with a no answer have a yes answer. So most of us, uh, even in my case, I have family members who uh, suffer from age-related vision loss. Uh, when you think of things like cataracts, the number one cause of uh, age-related vision loss, it is something that is directly correlated to age. Okay, It's directly correlated to age. Uh, I'll talk to you guys about some estimates uh, on people over the age of 40, how many people actually have cataracts. So there's some things that are uh, related to age. There are some things that run in families, and these are things that we have to be aware of. All right, so as I mentioned, cataracts. Cataracts are the leading cause of blindness worldwide. They have, uh, are expected to affect 30 million people by the year 2020. They lead to a complete blurring of the field of view, so what you can actually see. So if you look at the picture below, you'll see two little boys holding two balls um, in, a, in a truck in the backyard. And on the left side, you'll see the field of view of someone who has normal vision. And on the right side, you'll see the field of view, what it looks like of someone who has cataract. And what you see is this kind of um, blurring, all right? There's a loss of... Uh, of uh, detail, there's a loss of sharpness in that picture. 
And so someone with cataracts, what actually happens is there's protein that deposits in uh, the lens of the eye, and it starts towards uh, um, it starts towards the outside, and it starts to spread uh, towards the center. Um, cataracts are oftentimes happening parallel to dry eyes, uh, and that affects a lot of people even in their youth, so that's something to pay attention to. There is a clouding of the lens or a veiling of the lens. That is what is really significant about cataracts. In red, you see that I have that oxidative stress is a major, major, major cause of cataracts, and we're going to talk about oxidative stress in a few minutes. Age-related, so cataracts, as I mentioned to you guys, are one of the diseases that are expected uh, or the rates of cataracts are much increased the older that we get. So after the age of 40, there is a large percentage of the population that actually will have cataracts in at least one eye. Uh, diabetics. Diabetics are also at risk of cataract development as well. Uh, diabetics have, uh, especially when their sugar is uncontrolled, uh, sugar acts as what's known as a free radical in the system, and that can induce a lot of oxidative stress. So it goes right back to that idea of oxidative stress. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later on. Cataracts are irreversible, so the damage that's done to the lens is irreversible. Um, but there is uh, surgery. Surgery is corrective by about 98%. Um, oftentimes the surgery is very easy, it's a same day procedure, and it is relatively low in complications, but nonetheless it's a surgery, and secondly, there are some complications. Uh, dry eyes can be a result of uh, cataracts that can actually lead to other eye-related diseases or put you at risk for things like glaucoma later on. So though surgery is uh, a viable option, it's not the way to go if prevention uh, is possible. All right, so the next uh, disease of vision loss is age-related macular degeneration. I actually have it here as the third most common cause of vision loss, but uh, the estimate that it is estimated, excuse me, that by 2020 that there will be 2.9 million cases of age-related macular degeneration diagnosed and another 7 million people that will be at significant risk. So this idea of significant risk has to do with uh, some of the signs of macular degeneration. With macular degeneration, there are these deposits on the back of the eye, something called drusen spots or drusen deposits. If a person has more than one drusen deposit, usually two or three, they actually start to coalesce or come together, and they make uh, a very large drusen spot, and we'll see what that does to the field of view. People that are at risk, significant risk for age-related macular degeneration, have one drusen spot, right? but over time can accumulate more, and then again, this is when the diagnosis comes in. So though it's expected, or though it currently is the third uh, most common cause of vision loss, it actually, uh, in the next few years, is expected to surpass glaucoma and become the second. It affects the macula. The macula is at the back of the eye. I'll show you guys a picture of the eye in a second or an idea of how the eye looks in a second. Um, the macula is at the back of the eye where the retina is, and it's kind of right in the middle um, of, of the retina. The retina is the nervous tissue part of the eye, and the retina is actually where you are getting uh, the, the picture. Whatever you are looking at, it's going to be reflected on the back of the eye uh, on this retina. The retina has a high concentration of... Uh, nerve um, cells called cones that see very sharp, they help us with sharp vision, they help us with color vision. You can see the picture of the two little boys that we just showed in reference to cataracts. You can see it nice and clear, the picture on top. With age-related macular degeneration, you can see the picture on the bottom that it is not only blurry, uh, there's a loss of color, of detail, of sharpness, and what's very specific about uh, a and D, age-related macular degeneration. It almost reminds me of like a Polaroid, the old-time pictures that we used to take, you know, a snap, and then a couple minutes later you have a picture coming out of the camera. But if you weren't careful and you were in too much of a rush and you put your finger on the picture, you get this big old uh, thumb mark in the middle of the picture and a blurring. 
And so age-related macular degeneration kind of looks like that. They lose their central vision. Okay, they lose their central vision. So you can see where the two boys' heads are. It almost looks like you put your thumb right there. All right, so on the periphery, it's very faded and it's very blurry, but right smack in the middle, uh, there's a loss of vision. There's two forms of macular degeneration. Uh, there's a dry form and a wet form. Uh, the dry form is the most common form that's seen and that's related to uh, increase in age. Uh, Age-related macular degeneration is also progressive, meaning it starts out very slow. A person might just have the, the blurriness. They might have just the, the loss of, uh, of color and the, the blandness of the color in the background and start to lose just a small point at a time of that central vision. It doesn't happen overnight, um, and it's a painless process which makes it very insidious. It kind of creeps up to you. There's also a form of AMD that's called wet. This is a very short uh, uh, form of, of macular degeneration. It comes on very quickly, and diabetics are usually at risk for this, as well as surgical complications when I mentioned uh, things like for cataracts. This can be a complication uh, of that. If you look here, you're going to see in red again that oxidative stress is another major cause of age-related macular degeneration. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, this disease is also irreversible. There are procedures, but in general, it is irreversible. Glaucoma. Glaucoma is the second leading cause of blindness. Okay, um, It's painless as well. It kind of sneaks up on a person. It's called a sneak thief of sight. Um, it's a very slow and progressive tunneling of vision. So again, looking at that normal picture at the top uh, and then looking at the field of view of someone with glaucoma. Someone with glaucoma, what actually happens is their central vision is in turn, very different from A and D, but their peripheral vision is what is affected. Uh, one of the early on symptoms of glaucoma is a person constantly like bumping into things. So they're walking and they might bump into an end table or they might bump into the side of the bed and not noticing things that are in their periphery. And those are some of the earliest uh, signs of, of glaucoma development. The uh, macula or the back of the eye is, is still affected. All right? It also can affect the optic nerve. What's different about glaucoma is that there's a pressure that builds up in the center of the eye and that actually pushes back on the nerve cells in the back of the eye. You can see again in red that there is this idea of oxidation, all right, that is the root cause. Um, and then there are some lesser forms of glaucoma where there is normal pressure. There's not uh, this increased pressure, but still oxidation is at the root. Glaucoma as well is irreversible. So again, we're dealing with this idea of, of prevention, all right, or slowing the uh, decline. The fourth leading cause of blindness is diabetic retinopathy. This is a complication of diabetes, just like uh, neuropathies and other uh, complications of this chronic disease. It's a progressive damage to the blood vessels that are at the back of the eye. Uh, as opposed to AMD and even glaucoma, this disease is bilateral, so it's happening in both eyes. Uh, there's four stages to the process. It starts out with the bursting of the blood vessels. These are very small blood vessels, so it's not painful. It's not really noticeable. And then as the body kind of tries to repair, it overgrows the blood vessels, and this creates damage against the black of the eye and blockage of the visual field. It deprives uh, the, the retina or the back of the eye of nutrition, and it kills those nerve cells. Okay, So without those nerve cells properly interpreting the changes of light that we see, we cannot send that information to the brain, and therefore vision cannot be interpreted. But again, oxidative stress is a major cause of diabetic retinopathy. So all four eye diseases all have in common this idea of oxidative stress. Again, we're talking about it being uh, irreversible. You can see the picture on the bottom, normal field of view to your left, diabetic retinopathy to your right. So again, as those blood vessels burst and as they uh, start to accumulate in that area, they press on the nerve cells, and those nerve cells die. So the black areas that you see are areas where there's no nerve cells, okay, or, or a very diminished number of nerve cells. All right, so another quick question. Uh, how many of these apply to you? Cigarette smoker, that's one. Diabetic, two. Chronic pain, 
three, 45 years of age or older. So if one applies, please click one, if two, three, respectively. The reason I ask this is because all of these things are uh, kind of uh, instigators of oxidative stress. So cigarette smoking, one of the major things, if you look at any vision campaigns, one of the first things that they will say in terms of prevention is stopping smoking cigarettes. Uh, again, the reason why is because it produces just a lot of free radicals and a lot of oxidative stress, which we saw at the root of all of the conditions. Diabetes, same, same thing. Uh, chronic pain and also just the risk of being 45 years of age or older. So you guys can see here that most people have at least one of these. Okay, um, it could be the one that we have no control over, which is uh, just getting older. Um, but a nice uh, 10 percent or so have um, at least two, and a few uh, of you guys out there have three of these uh, going on. So again, um, just something to keep in mind as risk factors. So this idea of oxidative stress. So as a naturopathic physician, one of the things uh, that we are guided by is our principles. And totally call them means to treat the cause. Okay, so uh, when we're looking at any type of patient or, or chronic disease or any type of concern, we want to get to the root cause because getting to the root cause is what fixes the problem instead of just kind of bandaging it. As I mentioned, oxidative stress is at the root of all of these positions. What oxidative stress is, is actually too many damaging uh, what we call oxygen or nitrogen species. If you guys look at the top uh, right corner here, I have a picture of a, a game that kids often play, which is uh, a game using some kind of like tennis ball and uh, a Velcro pad. And so you kind of throw this ball and the ball sticks to the Velcro pad. Well, Free radicals or oxidative stress is almost like that. If we were to take that tennis ball and we were to look at it under kind of a microscope, we would see where pieces of the tennis ball, where the green is, might have pink uh, fibers and where the pink is might have green fibers. And what that's showing you is that uh, as this ball is being thrown back and forth, there's pieces of the pads that are being pulled off. Um, this is what happens with these oxygen species and nitrogen species. They are produced naturally in the body. The body does produce free radicals. Um, but we also have uh, inherent mechanisms to disarm these free radicals. However, when our environment, our exposure, whether it's pollution or whether it's things that we're self-polluting, whether it's cigarette smoking or chronic pain or diabetes or all of these different things can actually expose us to more free radicals. And these free radicals, they damage other cells. They themselves are unstable, and so they try to find stability by making something else unstable. All right? And so they uh, make the other cells in your body unstable. The other issue with oxidative stress is not so much just having uh, this uh, exposure of free radicals, but having a low antioxidant reserve. So if you don't have enough antioxidants, you cannot disarm these harmful uh, free radicals. Some of the causes of oxidative stress are damage, age, mitochondria. Mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. They are what provide energy. So just in producing energy, we are going to produce some uh, oxidative stress. But as we get older, we actually produce more because the mitochondria don't work as efficiently anymore. Uh, oxidative stress, as we mentioned, is connected to all four eye diseases, all right, um, either the ones that are paralleling the aging process like cataracts and and A and D, or instigated by diabetes, which includes pretty much all of them. Uh, oxidative stress also signals inflammation in the body. And in the short term, that can be helpful in order to kind of trigger the uh, healing response. But as you are exposed to too much oxidative stress and having too little antioxidants to disarm it, you actually stress the system. Uh, by stressing the system, you create this vicious cycle and you continue to produce more and more and more free radicals. Okay, and those free radicals, remember, are unstable, so they destabilize other things. Again, in naturopathic medicine, guided by our principles, a lot in terms of this medicatrix nature means to, to use the healing power of nature or the innate wisdom of nature. So you want to support the body's wisdom. The body itself is self-regulating. Um, it, it's naturally self-regulating. That's, that's, that's part of the design of the body. And in um, 
behavioral medicine, they look at this idea of self-regulation as the capacity to act in the long-term best interest. Um, In behavioral medicine, this has to do with being consistent with whatever your truth is or whatever the intended function is. But you can think about it in relationship with the body as going according to the design of the body, the intention uh, even of the creator. So when you have stress, stress ultimately undermines well-being. So oxidative stress will undermine overall well-being. You want to think of health as a dynamic interplay between pollutants and provisions. So pollutants are things like oxidative stress, cigarette smoking, uh, something called UV light exposure. We'll talk about uh, that's pretty much exposure, light exposure from the sun, and then blue light uh, exposure, which is oftentimes from many of our uh, tablets and computer screens and cell phones and things of that nature. And our provisions are our diet, what sustains us. Um, and then supplementary to that are, you know, vitamins and herbs and uh, nutrients, things of that nature, protect and preserve us. This picture that I have here is really funny. Uh, it's kind of this idea of, of, of normal workings of the body. So this idea of being self-regulating is almost like a seesaw. So if you have two people of generally or similar weight, they will kind of balance each other and you would teeter powder up and down. But if one of these things uh, is just, you know, this guy here, morbidly obese compared to this guy over here, he's going to keep the the seesaw kind of uh, anchored in one direction, all right? And so if pollutants, oxidative stress, uh, too much exposure uh, to the sun or to blue light exposure, these types of things all accumulate and you don't have enough protection, you don't have enough provisions to balance it out, you're going to be uh, imbalanced and therefore the body will suffer and uh, well-being will be undermined. All right, so again, another principle of naturopathic medicine is primum non nocere, which means to uh, uh, first do no harm. So one of the ways of first doing no harm is to remove the obstacles to healing. So there are obstacles to healing that we need to address. Again, if anyone smoking cigarettes or even around a secondhand smoking. It's something that you want to try to limit as best as possible if you're smoking but to quit altogether. Practical protection. So UV exposure, um, the uh, exposure to the sun during the summer months or even during winter months, uh, which tends to be uh, between the hours of 10 and 2, um, peak hours. You have to wear sunglasses if you're someone where your eye or your vision is already on the decline or if you know that you have um, a family history of glaucoma or one of these age-related eye diseases, you want to wear protection. It's very practical, all right, to protect against harmful UV light. The UV light is actually impacting the lens, so it's one of the greatest risk factors for um, cataracts. Also, um, this idea of blue light, okay? So if you can see in this picture that I have here in the box at the bottom, um, it's showing you a picture of the eye. It's showing you a picture of the front of the eye here, right? And that's where the lens would be. And UV light coming in from the sun, most of that UV light is going to concentrate at the area of the lens. Excuse me. A small portion of it will get to the back of the eye. Remember, the front of the eye is being impacted or uh, causes cataracts. All right, that's where the lens is impacted. The sun is also giving us exposure to blue light, and blue light is only a small percentage of the rays of the sun, uh, invisible rays, but they actually uh, they actually uh, go through the front of the eye, and their their impact is actually at the back of the eye in this purple box here. So blue light is affecting the retina. The retina is really the back of the eye. And the back of the eye is where uh, you are dealing with concerns of diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, and also uh, glaucoma. Okay, so blue light, again, is putting us at risk there. Now, blue light is not just coming from the sun. Blue light is also our exposure to all of our great technology that we love so much, which is our cell phones, our, uh, our computer screens, um, tablets, things of that nature. All of these are using oftentimes LED lights, which are much better for our environment, but they're not so great for our eyes. 
Um, you want to reduce the load, so how much of that you're doing, especially in the night hours. Uh, if you're working all day and you're at a computer screen at night, you want to kind of let your eyes rest, uh, not to be so much on the, uh, those types of devices uh, later in the day. Um, supplementing can help in that area. And also there's something called the 20-20-20 rule for blue light exposure, which means for every 20 minutes you're staring at a computer screen or your tablet, um, you should look away at something roughly 20 feet and you should stare at that object for 20 seconds. So every 20 minutes, you're going to take out 20 seconds and look at something 20 feet away. And what that does is it actually reduces the tension. It reduces the stress of the eyes. Uh, and that actually has a layover effect uh, to things like glaucoma and, and some of the other age-related uh, vision diseases. Another thing that you can try to stop doing, but it won't work, is to stop aging. Um, so that one is more so of a joke. But since you can't stop aging, you want to increase your antioxidants. Knowing your history is very important. As we mentioned, uh, what are you at risk for? What are the things that you can prevent uh, by just having that knowledge available? And then regular screening. You don't want to be uh, remiss to just get uh, a status of where you are now. Again, we don't have to resign to the fact that vision loss is guaranteed or is uh, you know, required. It doesn't have to be. All right, how many hours per day are you exposed to blue light? So computer screens, smartphones, tablets, even an LED TV. Uh, you guys can start answering that. So one to three, three to five, six to eight, or more than eight. Myself, I mean, I'm at a computer screen all day, so I'm definitely in that category of more than eight. I just spend that amount of time uh, at work, but I do try to implement um, that 20-20-20 rule, which really just came as part of me doing uh, the investigation and the research for this presentation, so I have to thank you guys for that. Uh, but this is one of the uh, things that we have to keep in mind. All right, so one to three hours. Uh, majority of people are spending one to three hours, which isn't too bad, all right? But again, a lot of you guys are in this category with me down here, 15% or so doing more than eight. And so therefore, there's much more protection and uh, much more uh, vigilance that has to be taken in that group. Thank you, guys. All right, another principle of naturopathic medicine, as we mentioned, was, again, first doing no harm. So how can you do that? After you have removed the obstacles to uh, the body healing itself or cure, um, how do you uh, kind of, again, um, help the body to heal or regenerate? You can eat for eye health. Uh, the eyes are very metabolically, uh, metabolically active. They're always working, all right? Um, so a nutrient-dense diet is very important. They're sensitive to high blood sugar. As we said, those blood vessels at the back are very sensitive. They need a diet that minimizes sugar, that's low in calories, uh, that's rich in fiber in order to balance blood sugar out. Uh, the eyes are at risk of heavy oxidative assault. So remember, we, we're looking at things, uh, our screens and all of these uh, tablets and things of that nature, as well as just being exposed to the sun. So uh, green foods have loads and loads and loads of antioxidants in them that can help uh, the eyes. And then finally, uh, lubrication. The eyes need lubrication, so a diet that has healthy oils, especially vegetable-based oils, uh, and even fish oils are, are great for the eyes. Uh, another question, how many fruits and vegetables are you consuming on a daily basis? You guys can start answering that. The reason I ask, again, the Halia uh, diet is a vegetable and fruit-based diet, um, even in terms of uh, the recommendations for uh, cancer prevention, uh, uh, talking about between 9 and 12 fruits and vegetables a day. Um, the idea is that all of these things are related back to antioxidants, and antioxidants are one of the things that we consider anti-aging, all right? And when we're thinking about age-related eye diseases, we have to, again, think about increasing our antioxidant uh, reserves. So um, the numbers are coming in. You guys are doing great. Thank you so much. So we can see that most people are in this three to five range, okay? That is the recommendation uh, by even like the USDA is three to five uh, fruits and vegetables per day. Um, a large number of you guys, more than a quarter, are at 68, and that's great as well. 
um, more than eight, this is where you want to be in terms of really, really increasing your antioxidant uh, stores. We're faced with and bombarded with just lots of, uh, of oxidative stress in our, in our world, so we want to try to increase that as much as possible. All right, so again, treating uh, the cause by protecting and preserving. All right, so I'm going to go through this quickly um, just to kind of highlight nutrients, uh, specific nutrients that can be very helpful for the eyes and what exactly they're doing. So at the back of the eyes, I talked to you guys about the back of the eyes being where the nervous system is, okay? When light comes in, that light is going to be kind of interpreted to the back of the eye, and then there's nerve cells there that take it directly to the brain for the brain to uh, interpret what we just saw. So these, um, these nerve cells require a protein. Um, different ones require different proteins. So the one nerve cell is called, are called ROS. Uh, another type of nerve cell are called cones. ROS and cones require two different proteins. ROS require a protein called rhodopsin, R for R. Um, ROS are very important for low light, so dim. Um, we heard about Reverend Paul who had... Uh, issues with night vision. So night vision um, is a type of uh, vision that needs to be optimized by the uh, presence of rods because, again, it's dim light, okay? Um, rods are also responsible for uh, precision and detail. Uh, this other protein called iodopsin is found in cones. Remember, cones are where you have the bright light uh, color, high resolution. Cones are going to be most concentrated in the macula, so they have a lot to do with uh, macular degeneration. Right? So as we lose the concentration of cones, uh, our central vision will be affected. The production of these proteins are vitamin A dependent. Okay? So they're vitamin A dependent. And carotenes, which are pro-vitamin A um, nutrients, are precursors to this vitamin A. And carotenes are found in lots and lots and lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, they are found in our green fruits and vegetables, uh, excuse me, our green vegetables, green leafy vegetables, but in many of the uh, orange and red and yellow fruits as well. Uh, you can see this picture here at the top, showing you guys uh, a picture here of uh, palm oil, of the palm fruit, excuse me, palm fruit. And uh, palm fruit is a great source of uh, beta carotene and alpha carotenes and even gamma carotenes, like a full spectrum. Um, lutein and zeaxanthin, all right, these are pigments, uh, what we call macular pigments. So they actually are what color the back of the eye, that really small portion that's highly concentrated in cones. So they're very, very important for macular degeneration. Um, also, this idea of uh, these two proteins, they're made on an as-needed basis. So another type of nutrient called anthocyanins are helping in the regeneration of this rhodopsin and iodopsin. Right, so that's one way of protecting and preserving the eye. Um, we also protect and preserve by blood vessel integrity, so making sure that the blood vessels are very strong and durable. Uh, the blood vessels need to carry blood, but they should not leak, and we talked about them leaking in um, diabetic retinopathy, for instance. Um, they're responsible for providing nutrients to the back of the eye, uh, to those nerve cells, and also removing waste. Um, they are compromised in age-related eye diseases, such as diabetic retinopathy and glaucoma, and we can protect ourselves. We can disarm those free radicals that actually damage the blood vessels by using antioxidants. Again, mentioning anthocyanins, they protect, um, they're actually potent uh, free radical uh, scavengers, which means they disarm those free radicals. Lutein and zeaxanthin, all right? Again, at the top here, I show you guys a picture of uh, called marigold. Marigold is a flower that is really, really high, uh, naturally high in both lutein and zeaxanthin. And they prevent uh, free radical damage in the macula. So this is, again, helping with uh, macular degeneration, uh, also helping with blood vessel strength. Uh, astaxanthin is an antioxidant. It's anti-inflammatory, and it improves the blood flow as well. Fluid flow, you want the free fluid flow, okay? So it nourishes, fluid is going to nourish the uh, areas of the eye that do not have their own blood supply. So the lens doesn't have its own blood supply, and neither does the cornea, which is kind of the uh, clear part on top of uh, the white of the eye. Um, the fluid is going to disinfect and wash away debris. It defends against inflammation and also oxidation. 
um, when some fluids of the eyes become trapped, they can actually push on the back of the eye, and that can lead to issues like we talk about with glaucoma. Um, eye strain from looking at computer screens and all of these digital devices um, due to blue light and all of these different things can also cause the fluids to become entrapped. Uh, we can relieve that by choosing anthocyanin. So at the top here, I show a picture of uh, a type of seaweed. Naturally, uh, you think of seaweed as being green. This seaweed is actually naturally uh, red, this beautiful red color. And uh, it actually absorbs um, UV light from the sun, and that's how it, it turns red and is able to kind of protect itself. So um, astaxanthin is uh, derived from this natural seaweed. It improves blood flow to the muscles of the eye, and that actually relaxes the blood flow or, or the um, fluid flow so that there is less entrapment and uh, decreased pressure. Finally, um, lens function. Remember, the lens is being uh, affected in cataracts. Okay, So the lens is necessary to bend the light, and that light is what's projected to the back of the eye uh, for processing by the brain. Um, the lens is avascular, which means it does not have its own blood supply. So it depends on free fluid flow, which means it goes back to the previous slide. The function of the lens is diminished in cataracts, all right, so oxidative stress, lack of nutrients, et cetera, especially when the eyes are dry, are all going to stress uh, the lens. So how do we preserve and protect it? Well, we use things like anthocyanins. Anthocyanins, you can see this picture here. Um, this is a beautiful picture of uh, a berry um, that we're going to talk about, and this berry is very high. It's one of the highest sources of, uh, of anthocyanins. It actually is higher than your blueberries and things of that nature. So you want to um, uh, just think of that particular nutrient as being very, very protective uh, for the eye. Okay. Um, lutein and zeaxanthin are also important, and they are the only uh, one of your uh, carotenoids found in the lens. So that's, that's also important for protecting against uh, cataracts. All right, guys, so how does this all come together? So the question we ask, um, what preventative measures have you taken to prevent or halt the progression of age-related vision loss? If you see your doctor once per year, um, do you supplement with nutrients? Do you do both A and B or neither A or B? So if you guys can start answering those questions, that would be great. So much. Why, why do we ask that? We ask that again because we've stressed the importance of knowing your status, knowing what your eyes uh, are now, uh, the function of your eyes and the health of your eyes, um, but then at the same time what we can do on the other end of that in terms of prevention. Um, and let's see. A uh, large percentage of you guys are doing both. You are seeing your doctor at least once per year for your eyes. Uh, specifically for your eyes. Hopefully you answered that question uh, related to the eyes and not just your overall primary care or general practitioner, uh, but your eye doctor. Uh, and you're supplementing with nutrients. So almost 40%, that's really, really good. So we just need to get, uh, especially this group at the bottom, around 15% of you guys uh, would really encourage you to uh, start having um, just some prevention. Remember, even in, uh, as early as the age of 40, you have to start thinking about your eye health. All right, guys, so Hallelujah Acres, Hallelujah Diet is, uh, has a supplement called Total Eye Health. Um, Total Eye Health provides clinically researched doses of all of the nutrients that I spoke to you guys about. I had them kind of color coordinated, and we spoke uh, specifically about them uh, in some detail in terms of the function of, their eye, of the eye. Uh, the, the nutrients are all synergistic, which means they're working together. They are naturally sourced nutrients, so we're not talking about synthetic uh, beta carotene, for instance, where we're talking about that palm oil, that palm fruit, which has natural uh, carotenes, and not just beta carotene, but other carotenes as well. Um, the astaxanthin, oftentimes astaxanthin comes from uh, shrimp or some other type of um, of uh, Crustacean, and so this is a natural vegan source astaxanthin from seaweed. 
uh, single sports, leucine and zeaxanthin. Oftentimes, uh, some uh, supplement companies and formulators are getting them from two different sources and trying to balance them. Uh, but um, the uh, this the leucine and zeaxanthin in the supplement are all from the same source, um, and it also provides the most concentrated uh, source of anthocyanins on the planet. The capsules are oil-filled, which is very important. Um, all of these things, many of them are antioxidants, and antioxidants themselves can become damaged if they are exposed to too much light or exposed to too much heat or are just uh, in a powder form, for instance. So these oil-filled capsules actually help to prevent uh, oxidation. Uh, they help to stabilize the antioxidants and keep them very potent. Um, they also help with the absorption of fat-soluble things, so carotenoids, need to be absorbed in a fat uh, medium, so do lupine and zeaxanthin. So having fat already in the capsule helps with that absorption. It also gives a little bit of dosing freedom. It's always best for most things to take uh, supplements with food, but it doesn't uh, kind of uh, disallow it. Uh, the fact that oil is there helps to kind of balance that out a bit. And it has additional health benefits. Um, Astaxanthin is known to cause the blood-brain barrier. So there's oxidation uh, that happens in the brain tissue, even linked to Alzheimer's. So there's some protection in that area. Same thing with lutein. Um, it also contributes to blood sugar balance. And the carotenoids have been shown to be uh, anti-cancer and um, preventive of cardiovascular disease as well. So I really hope that you guys have uh, enjoyed. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Paul if you... Uh, Yes, I'm, I'm right here, and thank you so much for all of that great information. It's, it's um, impressive how much there is information about the eye and how the nutrients can impact it. We're going to open it up for question and answers. We have quite a few questions stacked up, um, but before we do, um, we want to mention the winners for um, tonight's um, webinar. We have um, three winners that will be receiving a year's supply of the new Total Eye Health by How You Diet. Um, the first one is Charlotte Coleman, and the second one is Ivan Ellison, and the third one is Ruth Butcher. So congratulations to each of you, and um, we appreciate everyone joining us this evening and for um, participating in the webinar. And so we'll just go ahead and turn over to some questions here. So, you know, one of the questions that seemed to be really um, prevalent um, Dr. Savan, related to reversing or healing eye damage. So whether it was cataracts or, or something additional, you know, they're, they're saying can through nutrition um, and through really, you know, taking care of the body, is it possible to reverse any of these types of conditions? Actually, yes. They've done um, some studies, particularly with, um, and every obviously every every person is different, um, but they have done some studies with uh, early onset um, AMD, uh, age-related macular degeneration, as well as with uh, glaucoma and cataracts. And they found that um, taking things like lutein and zeaxanthin, uh, when they've looked at lutein and zeaxanthin over a period of time, so uh, one of the things with that particular nutrient is that it takes some time to balance uh, itself out in terms of finding like a um, uh, neutral level in the body. And so they found that like after at least three to six months of supplementation, um, in a particular study they've actually found that there's been some reversal of eye damage and reversal of um, vision loss. Um, to what degree, it just varies per person, but it has been studied and there has been uh, therapeutic use and not just preventive use of uh, many of the nutrients that we discussed. Yeah. Yes, and you know we've um, at Howie Diet we've dealt with health issues and and people over the years, and it's been amazing how when we give the body the nutrients that it needs, how it's able to um, repair damage. In fact, I remember one gentleman that um, had two thirds of his heart that um, was dead. Actually, they said that it, it would not regenerate, and um, it regenerated just by using high doses of um, nutrition. So. With the body, we just never never know what can be reversed um, when we give it the right environment for it. Um, yes, and, and so, I'll just add one more thing is, um, you know, I know at the introduction you mentioned with uh, uh, 
night vision, I think, with your father? Was it night vision? Well, it was um, any time he drove, but it was um, any time he drove, it was bad, but especially at night. Um, in fact, he okay. didn't drive at night because it was actually so bad. Yeah, and actually night vision is one of one of the easier things uh, of the ones that we spoke about. We didn't speak about uh, uh, night vision loss as uh, a particular age-related um, disease, but that is actually one of the things that has been shown to uh, really be um, effective in terms of supplements uh, being able to reverse and, and bring back a normal, uh, normal perception with kind of those high beams and things of that nature, the, the association of dim light um, uh, with driving at night. So yes, there's, there's a level or there's a, a lot of room for improvement in terms of giving the body what it needs, and that's really the guiding principles uh, even behind uh, my work as a naturopathic physician. Okay. You mentioned um, blue light, and um, in that you, you mentioned LED. Now, you know, a lot of people are transitioning to LED lights in their homes and in their offices. Is that the same blue light as what you would get from, from a um, smartphone or iPad? Correct. It is actually the same. Um, it is uh, the same type of blue light. Uh, I was reading on a bunch of different literature regarding uh, these different types of lights. Um, one of the things they sometimes recommend is kind of, they call it a full spectrum or natural light, um, but even that they're finding is not um, the best, that it still gives off a level of, of blue light. So the idea is we cannot completely um, eliminate blue light at all. It's part of the, the uh, spectrum of light, but LED lights do give off a large amount of that. Um, one of the other things that they mentioned with LED lights, especially using them in our homes when we turn the lights on, oftentimes is after uh, uh, dark, is that these LED lights have been shown to affect sleep um, and rewiring even the circadian rhythm, uh, causing insomnia. Uh, so having fluorescent lights, um, excuse me, uh, LED lights may be, again, a great uh, way of preserving uh, the environment and preserving our electricity bills, but we're actually finding that they do a lot of damage um, to, to the eyes, cumulative damage to the eyes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to, I'm just looking through to see if there's any other ones to pull out here for you. Um, a lot of people are really, you know, curious about repairing um, eyes, um, increasing their, their vision. One person did mention double vision and um, wondered if that was associated with eyes or, or some other issue. Uh, double vision can be both associated with the eyes, but it can also be um, uh, associated with, you know, other, um, other conditions. So it doesn't have to be exactly uh, related to the eyes. Probably need a little bit more information um, there just to kind of give a better answer, I would say. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, an interesting question here, because this kind of falls within how a diet's thought processes. Um, isn't carrot juice very good for the eyes as well as green juices? Is supplementation necessary with these juices, and when would you supplement? That's a great question. So, um, yes, carrot juice is a, a great um, source of Carotenes, um, those vitamin A precursors, uh, and green juices, again, a great uh, source of uh, antioxidants as well. So in addition, it, it depends on the amount um, that a person is consuming of those concentrated uh, juices, but these uh, nutrients, for instance, uh, lutein and zeaxanthin, they've, they've done studies on them to show that um, even taking uh, way more than what you will be found, say, in a supplement like this, which is 10 milligrams and, and 4 milligrams, that a person, uh, if they have age-related macular degeneration or if they have some type of process of vision loss that's already in effect, that there's not this idea of taking too much. I mean, there there is a high upper limit, but the upper limit is like, I would say, uh, 100 times what what is found in this uh, supplement, or at least 50 times what's found in this supplement. Something like 150 milligrams of lutein is considered, you know, high levels. 
Um, but the idea is that doing those things, if a person already has vision loss, these concentrated nutrients in the synergistic blend would still be helpful. If there's no vision loss, um, if there's no damage, doing green juices and, um, and carrot juices would be great for prevention. But if there's already some degeneration, uh, boosting that with a concentrated synergistic supplement would be helpful. That's great. Um, we've had several people ask about um, how many capsules are in the total eye health. Um, there are 30 capsules, and the um, dosage is, is one a day, is a recommended dosage um, for, a, um, for normal usage. So just thought I'd pass that on. Um, There were lots and lots of comments in here. We don't won't have time to get to them all. Um, somebody did ask about light. If there was a healthy light, that would be good for the eyes. I mean, we'll make that our last last question. We've really gone over time. Uh, we'll make that our last question here. Again, um, again, I I think the verdict is still out. Um, they they're saying that the older uh, regular bulbs that we you know have been using in our houses. Um, I guess you would call these full spectrum uh, bulbs that we've been normally using um, in our homes. That would probably be the best form of light because it's it's it has more of what we call the red spectrum, um, which balances the blue spectrum of light. Uh, but doing LED lights in the house, in addition to um, or LED lights in the office, in addition to all of the all of the uh, digital devices that a person is probably frequenting would be too much. Um, there's even uh, glasses that are recommended for people that are at risk for certain eye diseases or AMD. Um, they have uh, special glasses. Uh, they do have, uh, some of them are called like blue blockers and things of that nature. And there's ones that are better than others uh, because you still want to let in some of uh, the red light spectrum. You want to let in some of the spectrum or there's like a blue-violet spectrum that you want to let in. Um, but the best lights are pretty much, if, if I could use that uh, non-technical term, is like the old school lights that we've used for uh, ages. You know, that's probably the best form of light. The natural spectrum light is still, the verdict is still out on that. Um, the, the most recent research that I read is not giving that like an okay uh, for short either. Uh, but blue light is definitely, I would say, again, there's many reasons why it might be beneficial um, for you know, environmental reasons and also maybe for electricity bills. But as far as the light, um, the eyes, you want to minimize blue light as much as possible, not, not, not you know, accentuate it by having uh, changing over things in you know, the house or the office. Sounds great. Well, um, we sure appreciate you taking the time to be with us tonight, Dr. Savan, and thank you all the guests for, for joining us. This presentation is recorded and will be uploaded to the MyHDiet.com website on Thursday. So if, if you want to hear some of those additional points or hear them again, feel free to come back through and, and listen to the video. Um, we'll be excited about next month's um, presentation, which will be on the first Tuesday in February, and um, we just pray that you'll have a, a great month and a successful 2016. So good night, and um, thank you for joining us. Bye, everyone.